And we, we, we leave in two weeks and we're getting excited. And now I think you will see soon the uh, land acknowledgement should appear in writing. Okay. If not, you know, you know we're on traditional lands of the uh, native territories. Okay, moving on to the uh, uh, oh, yeah, for, to the call for worship. Okay, and uh, I'll read the part in black, and you read the part in red. So let let let's start. Call to worship. Return to the Lord your God, for God is gracious. Confess to the Lord your God. God is merciful. Repent to the Lord your God. To anger. Praise the Lord your God. Steadfast love. Worship the Lord your God. Together, let us worship. And now back to praising with your voices. And please stand with us if you are able. Excited today. Not only was it a big weekend, right? Celebrating amazing Canada. Woohoo! Woo <clears throat> but also, tomorrow is a very special day because camp starts. Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> You know. <laughs> so we are super excited because we've spent the whole week working with our brand new summer team. There is five wonderful young adults working with us this summer. So they're not all here with us today. We have two, which I'm going to introduce in a minute. But I think we have a video, guys. Yeah? So they're going to introduce themselves to you. I'm Rila. Hi, I'm Josh. And I'm Jade. I'm looking forward to our two family night events. And I'm looking forward to Superhero Week. And I'm looking forward to making crafts. And I'm looking forward to sharing my favorite Bible stories. <laughs> We're looking forward to new games every day. Day. And I'm looking for the water day. <laughs> I'm looking for the size of mm, See you this summer! <laughs> Hooray! Yeah, we'll post that on. You guys got the big reveal today. This was the first time that one was shown. Okay, you guys come on up with us. All right, so we're um, blessed to have Josh and Neha with us this morning, and they're going to be leading Kid Zone. So, but I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Each week, you're going to have two, kids, uh, two summer team members here with us. So you'll get to know them as the summer goes. But you guys go ahead and share something. Hi, I'm Josh. Hi, I'm Neha. Uh, and we're very excited to be part of the summer camp this week, or this summer. Okay. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> we love them. <laughs> All right, so I know um, the kids here today have been, are familiar with us, so we're going to go downstairs in just a minute, but we're going to invite Pastor Mona to come, and uh, she's going to bless them, pray over them, um, over the whole team, even though they're not all, all here with us this morning. All right? Yep. Yeah, let, let me do that. And, and would you please, um, we're going to bless these guys, um, and so if you feel comfortable, you can, you can extend your hand out because we're going to offer them a blessing. And uh, we are, first of all, so, so grateful to you for your part in this, this summer program, which is um, more powerful than we have any idea of. Um, the, the, um, the influence that these young people have on the children that come to our church is stunning. And uh, I, I imagine there will be years from now where little kids are grown up teens and say, remember that day at water camp, Josh? <laughs> it changed my life for Jesus. <laughs> and that's going to happen. You'll see. You'll see. It's amazing. 
So let's bless these guys. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for these young people, these young adults who have chosen to spend their summer um, glorifying you and working with the children of this community, of this, of this neighborhood, and of this church. And Lord God, I ask for your blessing upon them. I, I ask for your blessing upon the entire team, that they be safe, that they would have great fun, and they would point, they would point continually to you. And so bless them, Lord God, uh, as they do your good work, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. So excited. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. All right, kids, come on down. You can find out more about each of the team on the website as well. Greg has put some great photos and intros on there for us. <clears throat> Bye. Bye. You want this one? So, yeah, speaking of the website, I, I told Josh he looked shorter in his picture. <laughs> but, uh, yes, their, their bios are on the website. And other stories from the website in our email newsletter that we're uh, following this week. Next Sunday, we'll be meeting outside, weather permitting, weather permitting so bring your lawn chair. And we're having the Chapelaires. That's a gos Southern Gospel Quartet from London. So south of here, <laughs> from London, Ontario, they're a Southern Gospel Quartet from London, Ontario. And they'll be here next Sunday. We'll worship outside, so bring your lawn chairs. And we're having a hot dog barbecue. So bring your friends, bring your neighbors, bring your appetite. Next Sunday. Also, coming up next Saturday is the uh, memorial service or celebration of life for Toon Yang Jae. That's the mother of Barbara Lee, who you might remember is a, a longtime member of Amber Lee and a longtime uh, member of Scouts, Scouts Ontario. So if you were involved with either of those two organizations, you'll remember Barbara Lee. And uh, the memorial service for her mother is next Saturday, 1 o'clock. Coming up the week after, so that's the, uh, starting the 10th of July, we have summer camp. So the music theater summer camp and the mini camp still has places, so you can send your children. We also need volunteers, so send yourselves. You know, all of you sitting here. The camp needs volunteers, and we need snacks. So that, that's coming up next week. The uh, last thing to mention is we're not just Sundays. We also have prayer at the cross, Tuesdays, 8.30 a.m., either here in person or online. You have the choice. And uh, that continues throughout the summer. So those are the announcements. We go back, back to you, Brian. And Dave, I like your shirt. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Was that? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good, good, good. And we'll just get rid of the... Greg, do you mind just like lifting this down for me? So my hands tend to flail, so I just don't want to knock it down. Thank you so much. All right. Okay, we're organized now. Good morning, <laughs> and welcome. Welcome to those of you who are visiting with us for the first time. Thank you for joining us. Welcome back, all of our faithful ones. Uh, welcome to those of you who are joining us online this morning. So glad that you decided to tune in. Um, before we do anything else, let's just pray. Let's start with praying. I think that's good. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts bring glory and honor to you, O Rock and our Redeemer. Amen and amen. Okay, so we are in part three of a four-part series entitled Doing a Good Work. And today I pray that this message will be encouraging to you. But I'm going to start off with something that's a little bit difficult. I mean, we're going to talk about something that's difficult because the reality is this that any time God leads you 
to do something meaningful, to do something that maybe is different, to, to maybe do something that's generous or, or long-lasting. Unfortunately, we can expect some opposition. We can expect to hit some obstacles um, that are going to slow down our work. And you can look at this, and all, so many stories in, in the Bible that kind of depict this. You know, you had Adam and Eve, right? They were serving God, minding their own business, and then the evil serpent comes along to just trip them up, to distract them from God's will. And then, of course, there's Moses. Moses had Pharaoh. You know, Pharaoh was his enemy, and David had Goliath, right? And then we go to the the New Testament. And of course, Jesus had Herod and the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders and, and Judas and the devil and like all the haters that went on and on and on. Batman, Batman had Joker, right? And Nehemiah is who we're talking about today. Nehemiah um, had Sanballat and Tobiah and others who opposed his work. So if you're just joining us into this series, uh, we're talking about the story of Nehemiah. And let me just fill you in. Nehemiah was an ordinary guy. Ordinary guy. He was a cupbearer to, uh, he was a cupbearer. So he was a servant to King Artaxerxes in Persia. And he heard, Nehemiah, heard about the plight of his people a thousand miles away. Uh, who were in a horrible, horrible situation. They had been, and their city had been destroyed by the Babylonians. And his heart was just breaking. His heart was breaking for his people. And he realized, you know, something has to happen, and maybe I'm the one to do it. Uh, Maybe, you know, it might as well be me to do something. And so he seeks God, and he asks a favor of, of the king. He says, can I go back to my, my country, my, to my place, my homeland, and can I rebuild the city wall? I need to do that. And it's, this is a fascinating story of a spiritual journey and the heart of leadership of an ordinary guy who believed that God could use him to do something that had never been done before. And you can read all the details in the book of Nehemiah. I wish I could go through all of it. But when Nehemiah goes back, he starts rebuilding the gates uh, before he starts rebuilding the walls. Okay, So he is leading a group of people um, to rebuild the sheep gate, the fish gate, the valley gate, the horse gate, the water gate. Uh, during, during, <laughs> during, during, there's a dung gate too. I'm not making this up, man. Like you got to read your Bible. Okay, so I, I personally would want to stay close to the fish gate, but you know, not the dung gate. Well, anyway, and, and that's that just me. Okay, what's crazy is he in, he's inspiring all these other ordinary people to come alongside and to build the gate and to build the wall. Right? They weren't specialized trades people. They were ordinary folk. And, and what was interesting is that they actually saw progress. They actually saw things happening. And for the first time, the gates were coming up and there was progress in the walls and the people were starting to think, hold on, maybe, just maybe, we can do this. And the moment you tend to do something that glorifies God, you can probably set your watch on it knowing that a spiritual obstacle is going to show up. And we see this in chapter 4 of Nehemiah. So Nehemiah chapter 4, starting at verse 1, it says this. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Now, it's really interesting to note that the English translation for the word feeble in the Hebrew text means um, like a flower with the head of the flower cut off. It means that um, it's, it's a sense of the hopeless, like it's dead. It's, there's nothing that's going to happen from that. It's, it's been cut from the stem, right? 
So he's saying it's lifeless. They're lifeless. They're hopeless. No chance. There's no chance of rebuilding the wall. So he's, he says, what are these feeble, these hopeless Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Verse 3, Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what are they building? Even a fox climbing up on it would break down their walls of stones. What do you see? We see that advancement, advancement invites opposition. When we start getting things going, opposition very often shows up. And unfortunately, this can be true for us as well, right? I mean, who knows, perhaps in the past few weeks you've decided to move in a certain direction to do something, to make a difference, and, and all of a sudden there was this opposition. It could be as simple as just trying to make it to church on a Sunday morning because you haven't been in a long time, and, and so you, you're in the car and you're with your partner or your children and you're having the worst fight ever. You're cussing at each other and you're rah, 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 all the way before you sit down to worship God in God's house, right? Like there's that opposition. Or maybe um, you're trying to get out of debt and you decide, you claim it. We are going to be out of debt. We're going to pay off this particular bill. And the minute you say it, your air conditioner, in our case, breaks. <laughs> um, or, or maybe there's a car repair, right? And you got this huge debt now to, to pay. It could be that you want to do something and so you tell, you tell somebody close to you about this and the first thing they say is, who do you think you are? Like, you can't do that. What are, you, what are you talking about? You're not trained to do that. You can't do that. You don't, have, you don't have what it takes to do that. And someone that you love shoots down your idea. Don't be surprised if you face opposition. Don't ever be surprised when you take a step of faith and you see your enemy push back because advancement invites opposition. So what do we know about our spiritual enemy? Well, we know that the devil ain't going to bother you if you um, are not a threat. <laughs> That's what we do know. If we're walking, you know, doing stuff, whatever, not particularly godly-minded or godly-hearted, and the, the devil's going to completely, like, leave you alone completely. You're no threat, right? But the moment you step out and try to honor God, well, flags go all up in hell. They do. And you will see opposition, right, to stop you to, from doing what you know God has put on your heart. Expect spiritual opposition when you do the will of God. So here's, here's what I hope you're going to understand. That's, that, that is a truth. You, you can expect some opposition. But here's another truth. There are those of you who are being called right now by God to do something, to step up, to tithe, to pray, to invite, to show love, um, not just in the church, but as the church in the world. And the moment you do, you will face some opposition. You will have critics. You may have haters, right? Nehemiah steps up and Sanballat and Tobiah come and try to tear him down. So how do we respond to critics? How do we do that? How do you respond to the haters and the naysayers and the doubters? The answer is, most of the time, you don't respond. You just don't. Notice what Nehemiah doesn't do. He doesn't respond. He doesn't answer. He doesn't defend, okay? And, and here's the thing. Your response, our response, isn't going to convert our critics, you can respond all you want. It's not going to convert our critics, right? The only thing our response does is it validates the critics and we actually give them power. They're really not that important if we don't respond, right? So we ignore them and we keep on doing the work of God. How do you respond? Just don't. And let me say this, it's not easy to step out and certainly when people are criticizing you and it's never easy to deal with the haters, but it's even more difficult. 
it's even more difficult to deal with the doubt of the people that you love. And I know there are lots of us in this room who have dealt with that. And this may happen to, to some of you, right? You're going to feel called by God to do something, to take a step of faith, and someone you love, someone you trust, is going to step in with a strong word of discouragement. I don't need to tell you my story. Many of you know, right, when I became a Christian, um, there was a lot of opposition, a lot of opposition. Who do you think you are? You can't become a minister. You were born Sikh. Like, what are you doing? What are you, what are you talking about, right? But you'll get that question too, perhaps, in whatever situation you're What are you doing? What? You're not prepared for that. You should do something different. Don't be so stupid. Oh, it's hard when the haters hate on you. It's even more difficult when the people that are closest to you don't believe in what you are being called to do. So, so maybe, maybe you're feeling called to foster children, right? And someone says to you, well, you can barely handle your own children. Why are you taking in more? Or you think, uh, okay, you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start a, um, a life group. And someone says, well, do you even know where the book of Leviticus is? Like, how can you be leading a small group? That's ridiculous. Whatever it is. Oh, you're too old. Oh, you're too young. Oh, you're too uneducated. Oh, you're overeducated. Oh, you're this. Oh, you're that. When you step out, opposition steps in. And that's why this is really important. Any form of leadership, any, any form of influence, any form of ministry, we need to remind ourselves not to be moved by praise or criticism, right? Don't let praise go to your head and don't let criticism get into your heart. Let's not be moved by what people think, but rather let's be moved by what God thinks, And here's what Nehemiah knows. He knows um, that he doesn't have to answer to his critics. He understands that he answers only to God. And so instead of engaging on a lower level, he turns to a higher power. And once again, we see Nehemiah pray. I love this about Nehemiah. And he's praying. Watch watch the power of his prayer. He says, verse 4, Hear us, our God, for we are despised. In other words, the haters are coming at us, right? Now watch as he prays. Now this is not the way Jesus has taught us to pray. I just want you to know this. Um, And he could probably learn from Jesus. Uh, This is the kind of prayer that I would pray, that Mona would pray. He says, turn their insults back on their own heads. (laughs) That's what he prays. I like that. I mean, maybe I shouldn't, but I do. And I'm not telling you to pray that way. It's it's right here in Scripture. That's what he said. He obviously has some more maturing to do. And it hadn't been written at this point about turning the other cheek, right? So right now he's praying, God, get them. Get them, right? Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Verse 6, so we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. What did Nehemiah do in the face of opposition? Watch what he did. He prayed to God, and he got back to work. He sought the heart of God, and he went back to to work. And the wall continued to go up. Why? Because the people worked with all their heart. You know, I love Nehemiah, and you see this over and over again. He is both spiritual and practical, both spiritual and practical. He would pray as if everything depended on God, and then he would work like everything depended on him. I love that, right? Spiritual and practical. We need you, God. Guide our steps, and then we show up to work. We need your direction, Lord, and then we roll up our sleeves. We need your power, and then we get up, we take our shovels. We need your grace, God, and yet we're willing to do what you call us to do. We take a moment to pray, and then we show back up to work. Verse 10. Meanwhile, in the middle of all this criticism, the people of Judah said, 
The strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. So last time we saw, we saw progress. This week, we're seeing discouragement. And this is exactly what happens so very often when we step into doing what we believe is the will of God. We see a little bit of progress, and then we see a little bit of opposition. Verse 11, Scripture says this. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them, and we will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. What do we see? We see Nehemiah's friends and the people of Judah starting to doubt, right? And they're not just doubting what others are going to do. They're actually doubting their own ability to get the job done. Now, I don't know about you, but in any type of opposition, spiritual opposition, external opposition from haters, opposition from people that love me, um, the one that's the most difficult for me is internal opposition, right? It's when my own insecurities rise up and rear their ugly head and say, what do you think? Who do you think you are, Mona? What do you think you're doing? You don't have what it takes, right? And I don't know if you do that. I think, I think that's true for many of us, that it's the internal stuff, right? That we, we tend to listen more to our inner insecurities than we do the truth of who God says we are. And here's the thing. External opposition will only be as loud. Hear this. External oppositions will only be as loud as my internal insecurities allow them to be. So that's why we have to rise above. That's why we keep our eyes focused on Jesus, the author and protector of our faith. That's why we don't look to the left and we don't look to the right, right? Or listen to what the lower would say. We keep our hearts higher. And this is exactly what Nehemiah does. Watch verse 14. Nehemiah, here's the people. They're discouraged. They're starting to give up. And and they don't think it can be done. And Nehemiah says, After I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. What does Nehemiah do? He takes the focus off of himself and he puts it back on God. He takes the focus off of the naysayers and he puts the focus on God. And he's saying this isn't our battle. This battle belongs to the Lord. Our God is with us. Our God is for us. He will never leave us. And we believe all things are possible with our God. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And we know, we know that when we walk in, the power of our God walks in with us. My focus is not on what they say, right? Nehemiah says, I remember the hand of God. I remember when I prayed for months and months and months, and God gathered, uh, granted the king uh, favor and turned his heart to let me go. I remember the king provided me with provision and protection. I remember when, when he blessed me to go out. I remember when God gave favor to the people and to, to me with the people. And I remember when there was nothing and now the walls are going up. I remember that God provided it all and God made it all possible. He said, remember the Lord, your God. I can just imagine him standing there before the nobles and preaching some version of a sermon. You know, remember the goodness of our God. Remember when our ancestors were in Egyptian bondage and our, and our God split open the Red Sea and the people walked out on dry land and then the enemies, they pursued us and God closed up the sea and washed the enemies away. Do you remember People, do you remember when our God led our people by fire and fed us manna from heaven? Do you remember? Do you remember? Do you remember the goodness and faithfulness of our God? 
Just think back on your own life and the amazing ways that God has showed up over and over again. Remember the Lord your God because when it gets tough, I promise you, I promise you it will, you're going to need to think about something. And I know our God would rather you think about his power than those who hate God's will. Remember the Lord our God. The greater the opposition, the greater the opportunity for our God to fight for you. Remember the Lord our God. Nehemiah says in verse 14, don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of them. (laughs) Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Fight, people, fight. That's what he's telling them. Stand up for what you believe in, the goodness of our God. Fight for your families, he says. Fight for your sons, your daughters, your wives, your homes. Remember the Lord your God and continue to fight for healing. Remember the Lord your God and continue to believe that he can get you out of debt. (laughs) Remember the Lord your God. And remember that, and and just still fight. Fight for your marriage. Remember the Lord your God and fight for your children, for their freedom, for their hope in Jesus. Keep on fighting for that one child that needs a family. Keep on fighting for the victims that need healing and grace and hope and treat them with dignity and honor and respect in the way that they've never been treated before. Whenever you do something that matters, whenever we do something that matters, there will be a battle. You will face opposition. And I tell myself all the time that if I'm not ready for the opposition, for my obedience to God, I'm not ready to be used by God. So I say, God, make me ready. God, help me to know your calling. God, make make me ready. Help me to know what you've called me to do. You know what? I don't have to be chosen by people when I am chosen by God. You do not have to be chosen by people because you are chosen by God. What you do when there's what do you do when there's something in the world that that doesn't sit right with you on behalf of God? What do we do? Well, we sit down and we cry. We kneel down to pray. We stand up to act. And then when God is directing your steps, what do we do? We, we, we seek God faithfully. We define the vision clearly. You make plans carefully and you inspire people passionately. And when your enemy shows up and tries to slow you down, you remember the Lord your God, and you fight for what God called you to fight for. You don't give up. You don't grow weary in doing good. For at the proper time, you will reap the harvest if you don't give up. Keep on building one stone at a time, one brick at a time, one moment of faithfulness after another, day after day, week after week, and by the power of God and the grace of his people, that's what we do. You can rebuild the wall. You can be used by God. Don't let the voice uh, or the power of any opposition stop you or slow you down or deter you or distract you because greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. So, Father, today we pray, and as we We move to the table. We pray that you would stir our hearts. Move us, God, to do your will and to have faith in you, to remember you, and to continue to do a good work. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Um, I think that you'll, you might hear kids coming up, um, and if you do, that's fine. Just lovingly embrace them as they come up, boisterously, hopefully. Hopefully they'll do that. Okay. <laughs> this is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites all those, here they come, all those who trust in him to share the feast which he has prepared. 
Oh, taste and see that God is good. That's just, here they come. Welcome back, guys. Oh, we're so glad you're here. Come on back. Come on in, guys. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Very good. Welcome back. It doesn't feel complete without you, so it's good to wait for you to come and join us. We're going to pray together. Please join me as we pray. Gracious God, we praise your holy name, giving thanks to you with our lips and our lives for the power and the mystery of your word by which you created us and called us to yourself. We give you thanks for the power and mystery of your word by which you took flesh and lived among us through your son, Jesus Christ. We give you thanks for the power and mystery of your word by which you chose common people, forming the church to be the body of Christ in the world, we give you thanks. We praise you, most holy God, for sending your son Jesus to live among us, full of grace and truth, sharing our joy and sorrow. He healed the sick and was a friend of sinners. Obeying you, he took up the cross and died that we might live. We praise you that he overcame death and is risen to rule the world. He is still the friend of sinners. We trust him to overcome every power that can hurt or divide us and believe that when he comes in glory, we will celebrate victory in him. Therefore, in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we take this bread and this cup and we give you praise and thanksgiving as we proclaim together the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and this wine that we and all who share in this feast may be one with Christ and he with us. Lord, we bring you the burdens that we carry for the world in which we live and we ask for your peace. Guide and direct the leaders of the nations that they may lead according to your will and your desire. We pray as we continue to navigate um, all these uncertain times, Lord. We pray, uh, we pray for good health for, uh, for those who are suffering loss. Lord, we pray for those who are now finishing school and are starting their summer. We pray for, for good health for them, for all of our students and our, our kids, and, and pray that it would be a safe and fun summer for them. Lord, we, we pray that you would just be with each one of us here today and those who are joining us online that they would know who you are that they would be drawn closer to you even though the summer months are coming and things are a little more relaxed lord we pray that you would be first and foremost lord we pray that you would walk into the space that we have lord that you would grant light and peace and hope we lift all these things up to you, Lord, and we pray as you have taught us how to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And the glory forever. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and he, after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Each time you do this, remember me. Likewise, he took the cup and said, This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you do this, remember me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Taste and see that God is good. You have a fellowship cup with you. We're going to peel back the first layer. It's a, it's a transparent layer. Oh, tricky. 
and we're going to take the bread together as a family. The body of Christ broken for you. Now the second part, just lift, tear back the foil part. <laughs> The blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins, for your sins and mine. And join me as we pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you give yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen and amen.